Uh, good morning, I'm Jerry Levine, Chief Evangelist and General Counsel at Contract.ai. I speak a lot about AI, the future of law, and when I'm not out there speaking and learning more stuff, learning more about what is changing in the world and how to help lawyers perform better and adopt these technologies, I review a contract or two in my spare time. Uh, James. Thanks, Jerry. Um, yes, I'm James Gatto. I'm, I'm a partner with Shepard Mullen. I'm the leader of our 110 person AI team and uh, teach AI legal class uh, at a law school and involved in a number of different AI organizations and have been doing AI work for about 20 years. So look forward to our third uh, episode in this series, Jerry. It's been, a, it's been a great series and look forward to wrapping it up today with it even uh, uh, probably maybe the, maybe the best for last. I, I hope so. Um, one housekeeping item, if you do have questions or have while we're speaking, feel free to click the Q&A button. Uh, it should be on all your screens. You should know how to use it by now. And Willie will either answer it live or in response to the Q&A. And uh, hopefully we have a few questions and we look forward to answering them. Um, with that, I guess let's get started. We're going to cover an, a bunch today. We're going to do a little refresher, as James mentioned. This is the third session, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we've what we've gone through in the past episode, the past two two sessions. We're going to talk a little bit about the AI models, the the nature of contracts and and, and AI, not just not how they're reviewing contracts, but things you should look for whether you're a purchaser or a vendor of services involving AI and artificial intelligence. And finally, a bit about transparency and monitoring, as well as what goes on as the government in the US and across the world gets more involved in artificial intelligence and regulation of regulation thereof. So let's get through the refresher. Uh, I know some of you have probably been, this is probably not your first time joining James and I, uh, but you see my little AI generated robot on the right that PowerPoint made for me when I said, told it, make me a little blue robot. Uh, generative AI is what we're really focusing on in this discussion. There's a lot of different types of artificial intelligence from your phone's keyboard text prediction to what what things you may not think of, so including you know numerical calculations, figuring out how, how a computer telling you what field should come next as you're typing. But with generative AI, what has been really interesting and what is both both amazing and terrifying in many ways is that generative AI can take existing knowledge that it's built into these what we'll call large language models to generate new content that was not previously provided by humans through a predictive matrix, through natural language processing and machine learning. All of these terms are part of artificial intelligence. Uh, and with generative AI, you can make you can make audio, you can make code, you can write code, you can create images, you can write text. There's a tremendous amount of new activities and new ideas that can be created, but there's a lot to be aware of as well. So let's keep moving forward. So as I mentioned the word a few minutes, a moment ago, these, all of this generative AI technology we're seeing right now is based at its very, at the very basic level on what we call large language models. These are a type of neural network, which is a type of computer intelligence designed after the way the human brain functions. Doesn't function exactly like a human brain. We don't know everything about the brain. We don't know everything about how large language models work yet, but you probably have already played with some of these. So if you've used ChatGPT, if you have touched on BARD, if you've seen Microsoft Designer pop up in your browser, if you've created art with MidJourney or with chat or with OpenAI's Dolly, all of these are different types of generative AI systems 
that are underpinned by a large language model. Today, for today's discussion, what you really need to know is this last sentence on the slide, that an LLM is an artificial intelligence system that's taken in billions of parameters. We can call them words, we can call them images, we can call them whatever we want, and then can take all that and put them together to make content. Now, I will, you'll notice the last part, whether that's correct or not is a different story. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. And you, if you've attended our other sessions, you know, AIs, these large language models in their default form, in their public form, they're not always correct. So, so why would we use these? There's a ton of benefits and I will be honest, the next slide will detail some of the problems. There are a ton of benefits for using these tools for routine workplace tasks. Computers are, are far better at data analysis than humans are. Computers can increase the time and cost savings. One thing, one way to think about it is, look, we lawyers used to write things by candlelight. We moved to typewriters, we moved to word processors. At, those have gotten more advanced. Technology is consistently improving, and they're, they, you know, they don't need to sleep. Computers do not need to sleep. They will work whether you're you're awake or not. Um, another benefit is the ability to potentially get faster results that facilitate better decision making. And one thing that we always focus on is where can we get rid of a mundane task that doesn't create value, that doesn't do anything. In order to get, in order to work on valuable tasks that do have that value, now this isn't to say that that all tasks are mundane or all tasks are are can be automated, but there are certain things we do, whether as lawyers or generally as humans, that we don't want to do. And if a computer, an AI, can do those in place of us, maybe we should use the AI for that purpose. Now, next question and the next slide is, why wouldn't we use them? There are a lot of problems that we still have to solve. Some of these are very human problems, bias, a breach of contract, not knowing how they work. So where one of in the prior in our prior sessions, James and I talked about policy, ways to manage this with policy, ways to better use systems ethically. And if you haven't seen those, I suggest you check them out. I believe they're available from Shepard Mullen on their website. Uh, or reach out to one of us. Our contact information is easy to find. But there are a number of these issues. AI systems are biased in the same way humans are biased because humans are teaching them. Uh, one thing that you should be aware of is that if you're uploading something to a public system, you could be infringing, you could be giving away confidential information, and potentially some of these public systems could be violating somebody else's IP. There's, there was a case decided just a few days ago that unfortunately uh, involving uh, stability AI, where I believe the judge, and James, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I believe the judge got rid of, did decide on summary judgment on many of the claims, but still has an infringement claim pending. And while most of this was de decided in favor of stability AI, the infringement claim is probably still is up in the air and it's not clear how the judge will rule after a trial and fact finding. Um, you know, just to I mean, jump in, Jerry, that, yes, that's actually it was a decision on a motion to dismiss. So okay, I'm the court sorry. did knock out some of the claims, but the, the you know, kind of the rest of it was there there were some parts of the motion to dismiss uh that that stability and the other defendants had had filed that were granted, but most of the the claims where the motion to dismiss was granted, the court gave the plaintiff leave to amend because there just wasn't enough specificity in the complaint. So this is still pretty early on and not, not really a substantive decision, but it, it is worth reading because it is a bit of a roadmap of how the court's looking at some of the legal issues. Thank you, Jim. And this is why you this is why I stopped being a litigator. I didn't want to read the decisions. I wanted them to be summarized by James. Uh, so let's let's keep moving forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me pull one thing. One other thing you've probably heard of and that vendors like ContractPod AI and others are working on is this issue of fraud, misinformation, as well as errors and inaccuracies. There has been quite a bit out there. James, were you going to say something or? No. Okay. So let's let's keep moving because we don't want to spend so much time on the review. 
uh, you could see from this chart, from this table, uh, from this, from this graph, there we go, that a lot of organizations are considering the risks with these AI tools, inaccuracy, cybersecurity, yeah, and you can see where they really, where things are being led to go and what people are working on is, you know, inaccuracy, they think it's relevant, they're starting to work on it. Cybersecurity, relevant and starting to work on it. But we're going to start seeing these go move up and down. And some of this will come when James speaks a little bit later about the recent governmental determinations and the recent AI executive order that President Biden released on Monday, uh, how these are really going to affect you and what you should be thinking about at your organization to which risks will be relevant and which risks you should be working to mitigate. Let's keep going. Uh, so I mentioned a moment ago, sorry, I little stuffed up here. We mentioned that the, that the current big thing that a, these large language models are the really key thing right now in AI research. There's a tremendous amount of different use cases and there's different models that can be used for different purposes. So not every AI is a large language model and not every use case involves a large language model. For example, at Contract Pod AI, we use multiple different types of artificial intelligence and machine learning to do different tasks in the, in the processes we assist our customers with. Some of these are purely uh, inf inferencing, which, you know, think about that, that as a decision tree. Is this, a, is this a yes or a no? If this is a yes and this is a no, then go to the next step. Artificial intelligence, sorry, sorry, Lindsay, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't a cue. That was me just saying next step. Artificial intelligence may not need to be human-like, there's a lot of different ways to use it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things you can use it for. So now, now you can go ahead, Lindsay. Great, so I'm gonna pick up, Jerry. Thank, thanks for the intro there. So today Absolutely. we're really gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the, you know, contractual clauses and, and some of the vendor agreement provisions. And, and before we, dive deeper into that. I, I just want to pick up on what Jerry's talked about a little bit about how there's large language models, but but they're not all the same. And there's also other uh, variations of how people deploy AI. I'm going to walk through a couple of those. I don't want to get too technical, but the reason we're going to go through this is it's important to understand that depending on how you do an implementation, the contract terms can be very different uh, or the negotiation may be very different. Um, so Jerry's covered uh, large language models, what they are. Um, they're generally pre-trained, right? And so if you go to ChatGPT, it'll say I'm trained till 2021, right? Or there's certain versions of it. Um, and, and so there's technical limitations with respect to the amount of data, the date or the cutoff date by which the, uh, the training has been done. So it doesn't have recent information in, in, in some of the cases. The, it, almost all the LLMs, um, th they're very broad as far as what they know, but not very deep. They're not trained on specific domains. They're not trained for specific tasks at, at a high level. Um, and, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're broadly useful, but not deeply useful is a way to look at it. And in many cases, you get information and you don't know where it came from. And so it's, citations are lacking. There's some exceptions. Bing will, you know, with, with their tool, they will provide citations and, and show you a couple of articles from which they've, or, or other papers or sources, from which they've gathered information. So that's, we're seeing that, but that's kind of more of an exception rather than the rule. Um, I think just to go through, you know, understanding how companies now are deploying these large language models. Some, some use the LLMs directly, um, but we're seeing more um, iterations, right? And so foundation models are LLMs that can be leveraged via API or a developer platform to create a custom app. Right, so think of it as your instance of, of an LM that you can you can access, and so what what does that enable you to do? It does a couple of things. One, through prompt engineering, you can create custom inputs in a way that will produce the outputs in a way that's optimized for how you want them. Um, you can do fine tuning. Fine tuning is a way of using what's leveraging what the LM has as far as the training data 
and using some of your own data to supplement that. Um, so now you, it's not just all third-party data, but it may be some of your own data as well. And you can use that data. Um, it can be domain specific to make it, you know, whether it's medical or financial, or you pick the domain, um, you can enrich it with a, a deep uh, set of data on specific domains and or specific tasks. Um, we'll, we'll look at that just a, a little bit more in just a second. And then there's another um, very, um, I think, powerful and um, uh, technology that, that the, the use is growing with respect to companies who want customization. And this is referred to as retrieval augmented generation or RAGS. And what this does, and I'll, I'll explain it a little more in a second, it basically it augments the capabilities of an LLM model by adding information, an information retrieval system kind of appended to the model. So you can retrieve prior documents or information that your organization has created. So let's take a quick look at, at fine tuning and rags just a little bit, a little bit deeper. So you start with the models. This is, you know, kind of the, the left two boxes here are kind of where uh, the LLMs come in. So there, you know, the, there's an untrained model that gets initialized, it gets trained, pre-trained, and then you can you can do fine tuning, as I mentioned, to to have it be uh, tuned for specific tasks like answering questions, doing things like sentiment analysis or many other tasks, um, and then. You can also you can also train it by domain. So you could you could for if you want to uh, you know have it be more useful in the medical domain, you could you could train it on public data such as PubMed or your own data or some combination. And then with RAGS, it basically, as I said, it's like a pending an information retrieval system. So when a prompt and, and a query come into the the foundation model, the query goes to your information retrieval system and will pull back a set of documents that are relevant to the query and that information along with the prompt is then provided to the large language model and so it kind of constrains the output if you will so that it can you know if you say create a uh, supply agreement for widgets uh, being manufactured in Europe um, and you've got prior agreements like that it can leverage what you've previously done to customize it with your documents but add whatever other intelligence the LLM can bring and provide that kind of combined response. And, you know, so th these are just some of the implementations that we're seeing. They're not exclusive. In some cases, you can use fine tuning and RAGS uh, both. Um, and so, you know, one of, one of the decisions that companies face, as they do always with, um, with, with technology, is, you know, buy, build, or, or some hybrid solution and so we've just kind of mapped out here a couple of different scenarios. So um, in the in the column that says LLM, so some companies just straight out use an LLM where a third party trains the data and it's the LLM's technology. Um, moving to the right, you can have, you can license a foundation model and do fine tuning. So in that case, the data will be a mix of the, 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 the company that, that pre-trained the model plus your data. You can do foundation model with RAGS, in which case you'll use third-party data of the company that trained it, but your own documents or other information in your information retrieval system. And of course, you can combine foundation models with fine-tuning and RAGS. And then you've got a mix of you know, the, the foundation model data, your data, and your, your documents. So why does this matter? When we, when we look at contractual clauses in these vendor agreements, there, there's many... Um, you know, provisions that that'll be addressed. Um, many are kind of the standard agreements you'll see in any vendor technology agreement. We're going to focus on a few of the the issues that are somewhat unique or raise unique issues in connection with with generative AI. And here are some of them: the confidentiality, ownership and license of inputs and outputs, um, infringement liability for the training data, also for the output, and then indemnification. So, how does this kind of play out? So if you, again, if, if we kind of just map this out at a high level, um, starting in the left column going down under LLM. So if you're just licensing an LLM from a third party, you're not using any fine tuning or rags. It's just kind of off the shelf, essentially. Um, the, the confidentiality of the inputs varies. Um, you know, when, when you're using a third party tool, there's often there's a, an individual version that has a terms of service. There can be an enterprise version that may have different terms. And so these terms vary. 
if you're using an individual version and not an enterprise version, in some cases, your your input is not confidential. In some cases, you may own it, but you may be granting a license, express license to the tool provider to use it to further train the model. Same thing with outputs. In some cases, you own the outputs. Some cases, you don't own it. Some cases, you own it, but you license it back to the uh, to the tool provider. And if you look at OpenAI's uh, um, terms of service, it says you own the output, but they recognize another user may get the same output based on a same or similar prompt, and they own their output. You don't own it. So what does it mean to own output if two different people own it? Certainly, it's not exclusive ownership. Um, and, and, and often because it's not the output of generative AI is not copyright protectable. What it probably means is you own an instance of the work, right? Not not the work exclusively. Um, on the infringement side, if the output infringes, um, well, I'm sorry, on the, on the infringement side, there's two questions, liability for training data. Um, so if an LLM, if you're just using an LLM and they've, they've trained the model, um, none of your data is involved, it, I think the vendor should be liable for, infringement. Um, but as we'll see, in, in some cases, while they should be, they don't accept responsibility for it. And they'll tell you that you can't use the output if it infringes. And in some cases, it'll say, if you do use the output and it infringes, you actually indemnify the tool provider. Not, not a situation you really want. Um, same thing with the, uh, so that's the training data. Same thing with the output, right? The output may, may infringe. Um, so the infringement and indemnity issues kind of vary significantly. We've seen a trend in, in um, some of the large language models. Uh, Microsoft's been good, Adobe and some others. Google's come out with, with one recently um, where they're providing some level of, in, of, of indemnity. But you need to be careful. You need to read the indemnity provisions because there's a lot of exclusions like there always are with indemnity provisions. And particularly if, if you look at some of these provisions, if you're using your own data or if you're modifying the output, the indemnity might not apply. And so when you get into the, the next three situations on this chart where you're using some of your data, where the output may not be totally dictated by the LLM, the vendors may not want to accept responsibility for that. And that's why I put all these question marks. I think that's going to be a negotiation, right? And I think that's one where you know, if you're using your own data and and or you know rags your own documents, for example, and influencing the outputs, uh, you know there there may be you know there may be situations where the vendors say, hey, we're not going to cover that. So, um, you know, I think we just kind of lay this out to say that it's really important to understand the different technical implementations, and and these are just some of them. This is we're we're just scratching the surface to give you some examples and to show where the you know, the variables might be. But in, in these scenarios, there may be different negotiations and, and different results depending on what level of involvement you have with respect to customization. I'm going to kick it back to Jerry. So, you know, James, thank you. That was really good. And I appreciate that you were uh, you, the discussion on the fine tuning and the RAG, because I think that's something that comes in especially when we start thinking about how they can be trained for different purposes. Uh, and one thing that I deal with is, you know, obviously using uh, AI for assisting in contract review, analysis, and drafting personally as, as a general counsel and a provider of these tools. But in a more general sense, you know, we we are focusing on how do we, how do you, how should you think about these clauses when you see them? Now, I I think there are a number of groups right now that are working on AI clause sets, on AI language for understanding how to draft and how to think of. So there are starting to be some open source and general and general guidance on negotiating these from both sides of the equation. But today, and so we'll go through a few of these and I also want to be clear that we're focusing today very strongly on business to business contracts. Uh, obviously, there are going to be significant differences on, from a from a company that's that's doing work for consumers, individuals, not to mention uh, including you know privacy issues, how they use the data. We're talking on a straightforward 
you know, I'm a purchaser, you're, you're the, you're a company and I'm a company and we are making this decision. Uh, so let's, let's get, let's get to that. So as James mentioned a moment ago, organizations can either develop themselves, license from a third party or some combination. And keep in mind that AI functionality may not just be software, it could be embedded inside a product you're buying. Uh, I tend to buy, personally, I really like robots, and I have a habit of buying little robots to play with before my cats break them. Um, but, you know, that, that's also why I have cats, so that I get to buy new robots all the time. Um, so, but a lot of the business use cases and, and are really software based. Now, for those of you who are working for manufacturers uh, that are built, that have products with AI that are in them, you know, a lot of this will still apply to you, but we are focusing primarily on software contracts. And, but for those of you that are buying or embedded systems or using them in physical products, you also have to think about products liability. Because if, you know, we've seen a lot about Tesla's autopilot, and I'm sorry, James, I don't know if, uh, I'm sorry to jump there, but, you know, we've seen a lot about these autopilots. Uh, there's been a number of, of these issues lately, robot taxis, you know. So we have to start thinking, we have to start thinking, I wasn't sure if you are going to say something, James. Uh, no, 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 yeah, we have to start thinking about also, if you're in one of these industries, how are these going to be held up with, with tort claims, with product liability claims? And, you know, especially when you know, we look at some vehicles, we look at products that have no human control. And I, you've heard, I think I mentioned that I believe humans should always be in the loop somewhere to take, to make sure that at least at this stage that these products are being reviewed. Uh, let's keep going. So the first thing we want to talk about is reps and warranties for the AI functionality in in a software or a product that you're purchasing. So when you're looking at this, what are the potential business impacts of a failure? Now, I speak, I sell personally what Contract Plot AI sells to. Our customers are generally lawyers. So we want to make sure that the information that they're getting is valid, is controlled, and is limited to a universe that can be trustworthy. Um, so, but, I, and so I'm thinking a lot about what is the impact to my customers who are lawyers, if this gives them a bad answer. For software, what happens if the AI stops working generally? Are you up a creek or are you able to turn it over to a manual process while you figure out what happened? And as I mentioned a moment ago, for physical products, what if there's injuries or damages to a human or to property? Uh, there's also a lot of focus on infringement warranties. As James mentioned a few moments ago, the big providers are able to offer infringement indemnities and warranties that are tied to compliance with their terms. Now, smaller vendors who are then taking these foundational models and doing fine tuning or doing our RAG are, may not be able to offer you that same level of indemnification uh, if they can offer it at all. And but they're also when we look at these big big providers, their indemnif their indemnification obligation is very specific. They are going to point out that you can't you have to use it in the way that they've set it out for use, and you're going to see that vendors who are selling these to a purchaser for purchasers, you're going to see that these are going to be passed through, that you have to use it in accordance not only with the vendor's acceptable use policy but also the requirements from the foundational model provider. That doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that you're going to see restrictions on what you can do. And I think I, uh, so let's keep going, Lindsay. So we, we keep going, oh my goodness. Uh, I was up very early this morning, so I apologize that I'm tripping over myself. I'm also very excited about this. Um, so what can you look at when you're thinking about these indemnification and liability provisions? There is a, and again, there's a ton to cover here in just a short time. It does vary, as James said, whether it's a third-party tool, fine-tuned, or RAG has been used. You need to confirm how the liability is being allocated, who actually is bearing the risk. And again, 
what is the nature of the product or service? Usage in one situation won't be the same as other situations. If you are using this for legal usage, and if you're a lawyer using one of these tools as a legal assistant, uh, you're going to have a higher duty, as we talked about in our earlier session on ethics, to review the output of the tool than maybe a graphic designer who says, let me create a mock-up very quickly using mid-journey. So you have to make sure that the purpose that you're purchasing for and the vendors, what the vendor is pulling to contract for are actually the, the same thing. So if you go to your vendor and say, I'm going to use it for legal review or for assisting me in analyzing x-rays or something along those lines, and then you use it for a completely different purpose, you may not be covered. Uh, and so the question to ask is who can indemnify? And you're going to want to review that. And it's not to say that the vendor should indemnify in every situation or that the vendor may have an indemnification obligation at all. But you as a purchaser and you as a vendor have to work that out and understand that these there are going to be issues that will arise that one party will be willing to take, take a liability or indemnification obligation on versus where they find there should not be that obligation. Um, and speaking of limitations of liability, what is the nature of the product or the service? Uh, I mentioned this again. Is it AI equipped physical equipment? Is it if they, if so, how critical is that equipment or that process? If it's software, where is the data being stored? Who is who is responsible if there's reputational damage? Who is responsible for data breaches? Who's controlling privacy? Are they using public models without using an enterprise API, or do they have separated? Uh, or do they have a separate compute, separate storage, and separate instances for every customer? These are things that you're going to want to be able to answer, to ask if you're a purchaser. And for a vendor of these products, you're going to be able to, you're going to want to be able to answer these questions. And if you can't answer them right now, make sure you have someone from IT or from from your developers or someone on the line who can at least help you pass parse through those questions. So going on, what are the actual functions of the product? You should be looking when you purchase that pr purchase something, it should detail what you're actually planning to do with the product. I list out in all my contracts for our le product, Leah, our generative AI product, what you're using it for. Are you using it for guidance? Are you using it for knowledge uh, association? Are you using it to assist in redlining? Uh, they should also list out what types of AI are being used because what you're going to be responsible for or what you're going to be thinking about is going to depend whether you're using generative AI, a simple machine learning process, uh, a decision tree or something along those lines. And again, keep in mind that when we talk about AI a lot right now, we are talking about generative AI, but there is a significant amount of other types of AI and there will be additional new functionality coming out and new, new models and new ways of using these over the next few years. Uh, Jay has mentioned this a little while ago. Does the vendor train the AI? Ha it, does the vendor have the right to use your data to train it? Or are they pulling it into what I like to call a knowledge pool for education where the, where the AI is being triggered to go into that knowledge pool and generate the answers only based on that that knowledge base, that pool of knowledge you have. Uh, I tend to use the word, and I think James has been using it as well, inputs and outputs. Inputs are the information, including potentially your customer data, that you're submitting to the AI product. You should, and I think, especially as a customer, you should, a purchaser of these products, you still own your customer data. You still own your inputs. Personally, my feeling as a vendor is I don't want to own your input. That is your information. Outputs are the result of the AI's work. And again, if you can use those outputs, how will they be used? If you if you let the vendor use your inputs, how will they be used? Will the, will the data that's being created be separated and not usable by anybody else? Will it be aggregated and shared among multiple customers? Can, they, the, can the vendor use your specific inputs or outputs for other customers? And of course, 
these are questions that have to be answered on both sides. This may cost more to set up a, if you're purchasing, it may cost more to segregate data. Depending on the, depending on the type of thing you're purchasing, depending on the product you're purchasing or the service you're purchasing, the way you think about this may change. So this is, this is still me. So uh, intellectual property, you know, what we, when we talk about intellectual property with the training data, there's a foundational model as James mentioned, but then we have to get into, if you're tra training the AI on that copyright protected information, is that data infringement? Is it fair use? So courts are currently fight. Our courts are currently thinking about these issues, and you know, I, we don't know what the outcome will be at this time. To the extent that you're using licensed data, there's a case currently pending and going through between uh, Thomson Reuters and a company called Ross Intelligence, where you know they trained. Ross trained their their model using Westlaw data, you know, and of course Westlaw does not was not happy about that. So if you're using licensed data to tr to work on these models as a purchaser or as a vendor, you need to still comply with the limitations or restrictions. And for third party tools, the vendor should warrant that the right to use data on the way on which the model is trained. Now I'm going to be very clear here. This is if the vendor, that we have to think about this, there's multiple levels of vendor here. So your foundational model is going to be different than your intermediary vendor. And, but if your intermediary vendor can't warrant that their own training, that what they've done for fine tuning is based on the data that they have the right to use, then there's another problem that you may be brewing in your, in your purchase of that product. So that is a question you should ask as a purchaser and as a vendor, you should not be using data to train or to further build models that you do not have the right to use. James, did you one want to add anything there? In there Jerry. Uh, so one other important thing that this slide highlights is that you know, people, a lot of people talk about infringement indemnification and we use that term you know, kind of broadly earlier. The, the significance of the fact that um, some of these models are trained on data that's subject to a license, and these licenses have compliance obligations, limitations, and or restrictions, is that the, the you know, you, if you use the output of a model that was trained on licensed data, and it wasn't used in a way that was consistent with the license or didn't re re uh, comply with the compliance obligations, your use may still be a breach of that license. So it may not, it may or may not be an infringement, so when you think about indemnification, in, in, of course, intellectual property infringement is very important with respect to Gen AI, but there may be other contractual claims or other claims. So some of the cases that are pending um, deal with removal of copyright management information, so claims under DMCA. There's uh, breach of contract claims for, like in the uh, the case against GitHub, where allegedly you know the output includes open source that's subject to licenses and it's not complying with the open source license obligations. So, you know, the point is, when you think about indemnification, infringement is always what pops to, in people's mind first, and it's important, but it's not the only thing. So you want to think about the scope of indemnity if it's all third-party data that's being used. Thank you, James. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and then, then the next, so on, and we talked about the output just to kind of drill down a little bit deeper. Um, so we talked about the output is typically not protected by, by IP. The copyright office said that it's typically not, it's not human author. It's not going to be copyright protectable. Um, so you want to think about, you know, the allocation of ownership, what it means if there's any licenses going back to the, to the tool we talked about that earlier. Um, so, you know, th this is another area that you just want to focus on and understand depending on how you're using it, you you may care more or less about the output, but this is a point that's going to be negotiated due to some of the, the uncertainty and, and some of the different models that are out there. Um, you know, and, and I mentioned earlier, it's kind of this question of what, what do you own if there's no IP, right? So you probably just own an instance, uh, non-exclusively own an instance of the information that's there. So if that's all you're getting, as long as you have a right to use it, do you really care, right? So 
you know, you may, but, um, you know, that's something you want to take into account as far as far as where you really shoot your bullets as far as what you what leverage you may or may not have with respect to uh, negotiations, especially with a, a larger vendor. Um, and, and just this, we're not going to go through this whole thing, but just this is just an example from Microsoft. We're talking about some of the exclusions. Basically, they they the first part says they'll indemnify you. But it says for an unmodified um, form provided by Microsoft, not combined with anything else. So, if you're, you know, adding your material, your data, or if you're adding to the output, um, you know, that it, it may be outside the scope of of this particular indemnity. Um, and and this this is another one which shows that you know some of the, the limitations. Um, my, again, Microsoft will protect you against third-party claims. No, it doesn't just limit it to infringement, which is good. Um, uh, it, it, to the extent that it allows any customer data, um, it, 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 this is the exclusion, right? So they'll, they'll cover you except to the extent it alleges that any customer data or non-Microsoft product uh, causes the claim. So if you're training on your own data, for example, that could be an issue. If you're using RAGs and it, it's part of the information retrieval system that causes it, that could be a problem. Um, and of course, the last one is a pretty broad exclusion. If it, if if the customer uses any product, services, or deliverable uh, alone or in combination with any anything else that causes the harm, then that's going to be outside the scope of the uh, the indemnity as well. So, again, focus on the scope of the indemnity, the legal claims covered, not just infringement. Think about what the exclusions are and whether they make sense under the fact scenario. Those are some of the key takeaways there. Back to you, yeah, I would note, I, I would note with the prior clause, a lot of these are things we are used to seeing. It's just now we have to think. You have to think as an attorney dealing with this. You have to think a little harder about how this tool will be used. Is it entirely for internal use, where no one will ever, where no one, where this is not being published, or are you going to push it out to the entire world? So. You know, there there is a lot to think about as you adopt them, uh, and as they're being as you are, start to go through the process of selecting a vendor or purchasing something that looks cool. You want to make sure that you understand a little bit more about how it does how it does what it does, but also you want to understand a little bit more about what they're doing. Now, if you remember a few moments ago, I mentioned that for for me, at our company, we have both third-party and first-party models we've designed. Uh, so, And depending on the vendor, you may see first-party AA models or third-party AA models. First-party, of course, is you design them in-house, you built them, you built them using the tool, you built them using various historical models, you've built them using your own data entirely. Third-party models are going to be the ones that are coming from Microsoft, from OpenAI, from others. Uh, one thing that I recommend is when, if a vendor shows up or if you are a vendor or you're purchasing, ask the same question you would ask if you're thinking about a data processing agreement. What subcontractors are they using? Who is providing their models? What are the re restrictions on those underlying models? Because as, J as James just showed a moment ago, there may be restrictions in what you can do using those models that go beyond what the, what the vendor tells you is already is already restricted or is all part of their acceptable use provisions. So you you can expect to see additions to these acceptable use provisions, uh, including flow downs from the model providers in, in your contracts going forward. It's not going to always be there, but you will see them. And an, just a quick list of some of these additional requirements that you'll see, some of them mirror existing you will not use, you know, if you've ever negotiated a, a, a software contract, you've probably seen the word, you will not use this as a service bureau or as a managed service. A lot of these are flowing right from those existing typical clauses. So you'll see prohibitions on using generative AI to do purposeful infringement, to train or create new models that the You'll, you'll see one, you'll see often that the vendor has vetted the content because these are generating new content. A vendor can't, can't confirm 
that everything it will produce will be exactly what you're expecting. And of course, we do know, having talked about this before, there is bias in some of these AI models, which is why it's important to have a human overseeing them, uh, because you don't know what that AI model may produce given a specific question. Uh, I know that Bing and I know that OpenAI and Google both specifically prohibit pr holding the AI's output as that of a human being. Uh, you cannot you, you mo almost everyone will say you cannot use it to violate data processing laws at, or to discriminate or harass others. So there are going to be uh, there are going to be these similar provisions that you've seen with all sorts of contracts before. Only now they're going to apply to the output of the AI or to your own inputs. And you're going to see, because one of the things I can tell you as a, a vendor and a purchaser of these products is that we are being, we, we have to comply with these rules as well. If you put into my product a series of extremely discriminatory questions, we will begin getting a notification from the trust and safety provider at the third-party model that someone is using this in a potentially discriminatory manner. They may not be looking at the output. They may not be have a human even involved telling us about this. So it's it's less of a data protection issue. But we can we you do need to be assured you do need to be aware that there are going to be restrictions on how you use these. James, did you have something you wanted to add? Nope, all good. Uh, one big issue that you're going to come into and that you should, as a purchaser, be aware of is transparency and monitoring of these systems. One of the biggest complaints, and it's constantly repeated on the internet, on social media, by news reporters, uh, by folks all over, is that these tools are black boxes. You, as a vendor, you should be able to at least disclose how the how the model arrived at a conclusion. Show me the sources. Show me why it made that. Uh, tell tell the user, tell the purchaser why it made that decision. Again, I note that I sell to lawyers and to legal uh, in-house departments, and I work. These are our customers. So for me, this is really important because I want my customers and myself to be able to know why our AI is providing this answer to a question that you get asked. So we give you the citation. We tell you what may help the AI make this decision. Now, what's very funny about this or very scary, depending on your point of view, is just like the human brain, just how neurologists don't really understand everything about the human brain, developers and AI experts are not entirely sure how large language models work. They just know they do work. They're getting closer, but there's still a lot to figure out about how these models actually make decisions. So it's important when you ask your as a vendor or as a purchaser that you know how these decisions are being made. Uh, recently, Romanian, and it's right here on the screen, uh, Romanian member of the European Parliament uh, said in terms of the, AI, the EU's AI regulations and AI laws that they're, that they're currently debating and bringing into place, that artificial intelligence does have a profound impact on everything we do. And so that, and therefore it's time to bring in safeguards and guardrails on how this technology will evolve for the benefit of our citizens. James will get into it in just a moment or so about the US, what the US is doing with President Biden's executive order. Uh, so, you know, let's keep going into that. Um, oh, right. So funnily enough, when I wrote this on Sunday, uh, there was no executive order. And as of Monday, there was, so it may be that this statement is a little, is not entirely true anymore, that we're a little behind the European Union, but I would say that we're approximately at the same place now and the regulatory and legal requirements and analysis and, and, and investigations are strongly gaining, gaining steam in the US, in Europe, in Africa, across the globe. This is all going ahead. And the priorities of most of these regulations and laws is very clear. Safe, transparent, safe and transparent. They, the output has to be traceable. They can't, they can't discriminate. And that these systems should be environmentally and socially conscious. 
Uh, again, a lot of this comes down to trustworthy AI, understanding what it does, understanding how it makes decisions, avoiding bias, requiring or in or strongly recommending that humans are involved in decision making. Um, I actually spoke with someone this morning who was bringing up employment AI systems and how they're, the output they're getting is often discriminatory because these systems have been built in based on potential biases that are being magnified by the AI, whether it's someone's name, where they went to school, where they're from, even their address. So it's very important to have a human teaching and continuing to work with these systems and overseeing them to prevent harmful outcomes. And one of my favorite things to say is an, a warning from the 1970s that was posted up in, in IBM's office, which was, Never let a computer make a final decision because you can't dis discipline a computer. A computer can't be fired. A computer can't be held responsible for its crimes. A computer can't be held responsible for its output. It can only, only the people who are overseeing that, who are designing it, and ultimately approving or disapproving of the workings of that AI model of that computer can be held responsible. So you should always... And as much as I love AI, as much as I think this is important, I think you always need to have a human overseeing it and helping ensure that the decisions being made are fair and correct. James. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of slides pretty quickly so we can get to the to the White House executive order. Um, you know, Jerry's talked about the transparency part and, and how you want to press the vendors to understand you know, how decisions are made. In some cases, you can ask the questions and they're going to tell you we don't know. But but there's additional questions you can ask. And I think some of the things that guide the questions you want to ask are, what are some of the other regulatory issues that users need to be concerned about? And I think if you look at the FTC, for example, they, they've been one of the more prolific agencies with respect to issuing warnings, guidance, policy statements, and engaging in enforcement in the AI space. And some of the key topics they focus on are, are listed here. And so while a, a LLM may not know exactly how decisions are made, they know how the tool is built, what it's trained on, how it's been tested. So you can, you can ask questions around what testing has been done to ensure there's no bias. There, there's protocols that are being developed and that are developed and more that are coming out uh, to, to test for bias. So ensure that they've done that. Um, you know, safety and reliability, depending on the nature of the use, um, like, for example, um, autonomous driving, obviously, safety is a huge issue. If you're just outputting pictures, it may not be as big an issue. But to the extent that the use case that you're looking at um, impacts safety and reliability, you want to know what testing has been done um, and, and, and so on. And, you know, if, if you see advertising claims from vendors, um, you know, ask them about it. If they say certain level of accuracy, how, how do they come up with that number? What, what testing do they do? See see what's behind those claims to make sure that this is not <laughs> vaporware or something close to it that's just, you know, people jumping on the AI bandwagon as opposed to real players that are, you know, have built systems, tested them, and are, they're working on legit systems like ContractPod and, and others. So, um, you know, on, on the bias, I, I won't go through a lot more detail I don't know if we've mentioned this yet. If you haven't watched the, the documentary Coded Bias, it's really powerful if you want to learn about bias and discrimination and algorithms. But where it can come from is, as Jerry mentioned, it can be the data itself can be biased. Algorithms can be biased, but there's also use cases. You, you could have an AI system that's perfectly fine. It can be used in a way that's discriminatory. So again, you want to you want to think through like what's in the control of the vendor and seek you know, diligence and then indemnity with respect to at least their actions. Um, one, one of the things to really look at, and this will be enhanced uh, later in the next few months, um, but NIST put out a, a framework for responsible AI. Um, and there's some guidance in there on, you know, how to, how to address some of these issues. Um, another uh, document that's really, and I'm going through this because people sometimes ask, would people talk about this, but how do we know what to do? So I'm a member of the International Technology Law Association, which is a, if any tech lawyers, if you're not involved, you should, it's a great organization. They put together a publication a couple of years ago on responsible AI, and it's got a lot of like to-dos, checklists, you know, and things you can go through. Um, they just updated it um, in, in 2022, I believe it was, um, but those are available online. 
Um, James, did you want to so, jump to that slide? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Oh, um, yeah, Where sorry. There we go. Okay, and then you're going to cover the transparency. Uh, so we're, we're, I know we're going quick now because I do want to get to James's big thing, but do you, uh, and in fact, a lot of this I, I touched on before, but you, you might remember, you know, what tools are being offered or what are they working with to provide safety? Are they requiring oversight by regulated professionals for restricted use cases? And can you do a POC or can you test the tool or are you at least able to go in and look at you know, work with the vendor to make those decisions. Uh, but also, you know, how, what, th there's a lot that you can ask of a vendor and you should be, a per as a purchaser, you should be asking these questions to make sure that the vendor, as James said, is not so, is not just fly by night, but is actually considering these issues. Okay, so just to wrap it up, um, we, we kind of threw in a bonus slide here. Uh, we weren't planning on covering this, but given the uh, the news on Monday, um, as, as many of you probably know by now, the White House issued an executive order on AI. It is extremely broad. Um, a lot of it is uh, because it's an executive order. It's not new law. It, it's it's the executive branch can't really make new law, but they are. Uh, there's a lot of directives from from the White House to different agencies on actions they should take or reports they should be generating to, um, you know, kind of move forward in, in, a, in a certain direction, kind of guided by what's in this executive order. Um, so some of the things that uh, are important to note is that it will impose testing obligations on developers of some of the more powerful systems. They use kind of generally broad language to keep it flexible. Um, and those results will have to be shared with the government before, um, for, for any of the systems that are, that are covered by this, um, before new systems are deployed. So they're going to have to show safety and testing up front. And there'll be um, parameters to, you know, kind of develop to specify what type of testing and the nature of the testing and the results, et cetera. So I think that that's um, going to be a, a big impact on the large language model providers. Um, it, it directs many of the agencies to take specific actions to, um, in general, protect people um, but there's specific actions in there with respect to consumers, patients from the standpoint of healthcare, students with education, a lot in there to protect workers and use of AI in the workplace. Um, there's uh, different agencies uh, that impact different industries. So the Department of Transportation has some directives, um, the FCC uh, with, with the communications industry, et cetera. And so we're going to see a lot of agency activity and it also mandates uh, in interagency cooperation. Um, there's a requirement um, for uh, an assessment of the potential job displacement due to AI and some um, thoughts on how to remedy that. Um, on the issue of content authentication and provenance and deep fakes, um, it's mandating in some cases, at least for government use, um, the, the use of content authentication and provenance and in, in other cases, even non-government use, there's going to be some implications there as well. So that content can be tagged. So you know if it's AI generated, um, there'll be various different technologies that will be used uh, as, as these regulations get implemented. Um, with respect to privacy, which is a big issue, um, largely executive order punts to uh, Congress and, and calls on Congress to implement federal privacy legislation. Don't hold your breath on that happening anytime soon. <laughs> We're talking about Congress. Um, and th this is something that's been talked about for years, but um, we'll we'll see what happens with that. Um, it takes aim at what I call bad AI, bad being an acronym for bias and discriminatory discriminatory AI. There's there's many sections in the executive order that are focused on promoting equity and civil rights, uh, avoiding bias and discrimination in many different instances. Um, and again, it'll impact different agencies in, in those regards as well. Um, it also focuses on the government's use. The, 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 the executive order makes very clear the government is very bullish on using AI technology for government purposes, um, but wants to do so in a responsible way. And it, and it tasks various agencies to uh, assist in coming up with best practices and 
and other aspects for the government's own use of AI. Um, on a kind of a more macro picture, it also um, it creates programs and will provide resources to enhance U U.S. leadership and innovation. There's going to be grants. There's going to be additional resources, information, tools, et cetera, that will be made available, particularly to startups, um, to enable the U.S. to flourish and, and to have a vibrant AI tech community here. So that's very that's very positive. Um, there's also um, some indications that the U.S. wants to take a, a leadership role in coordinating global regulatory efforts. There's been a lot that's happened already. Um, the EU AI Act. Um, there, there's um, the UK is is doing a lot. In fact, yesterday and today, the UK is holding uh, a conference on AI safety. Um, there, there. So there, there are other countries that are in regions that are that are kind of leading. The U.S. wants to kind of jump into that with both feet and provide global leadership. And um, but recognizing that there's also significant um, potential harm from from bad foreign actors. There's a number of provisions in the in the uh, executive order that focus on critical infrastructure and security of uh, government systems, as well as uh, other other systems used in the U.S. that might be vulnerable to AI. So there's a lot more there. That's kind of the big picture of kind of what's covered. Um, I'm doing a briefing. Our firm is doing a briefing. Um, myself and one of my colleagues who's in our leads our government business group um, this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you scan the QR code, if you're interested in joining, we're going to dig down into uh, the executive order and kind of what it means in uh, a lot more detail. And I think that is pretty much it for yeah. our presentation today, right? Yes. Thank you, everyone who's attended. Um, check out the chat if you'd like to join James and Townsend for their flash briefing this afternoon. The link is in the chat. And uh, we I hope uh, that we've helped you out and given you some things to think about. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, everybody. And thanks Thank for you, tuning James. in. And Let's keep the conversation going. There's lots of interesting issues. We we learn from questions. And so if people want to chat uh, afterwards, this would be great uh, to continue the conversation. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.